I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Joachim from Sabaton. And this is Sabaton History. The most prolific sniper in any war was a Finnish soldier fighting in Finland's winter war against the Soviet Union. And the man is Simo Hauha, and the Russians knew him as the White Death. Simo Hauha was born December 17, 1905, in the small Finnish municipality of Rautjärvi, near the Russian border. His peers described him as a friendly, mild-mannered, introverted man who kept to himself and to his daily work as a farmhand. Rautjärvi is surrounded by the tough Finnish wilderness, so although Simo grew up in quiet times away from city life, his own life was far from easy. The harsh, unforgiving winters forced the people of southeast Finland to come to terms with the wilderness around them. Early on, Simo excelled as a naturally gifted hunter, spending most of his youth outside in the forest, shooting small game with an old bolt-action rifle. By the age of 20, he had undergone his mandatory military service and had been promoted to corporal. He took part in several skiing and shooting competitions. He was a real biathlete, and he was especially renowned for his skills with the rifle. Like most Finnish men, he had joined the national militia after his compulsory service. This was the Suo Jeluskunta, a service for young men that dated back to Finland's declaration of independence in 1917 and the Civil War the following year. The service trained men like Herhe to be prepared for those times when Finland most needed them. Such times came November 30th, 1939, as the Soviet Union declared war on Finland. A man from a simple upbringing like Simo Herhe cared little for world politics, nor much about the ambitions of, of dictators of the time like Joseph Stalin. But like many Finns, he was fiercely independent and valued his and his country's liberty above pretty much all else. That liberty would be lost if the Finnish people did not stand up to defend it, regardless of the size of the enemy. So as the call to arms came, Herhe, like many of his countrymen, answered. Almost night, a crimson horizon, painting thousand legs red. As your army approaches the east, a hunter is switched in his prey. He joined the 34th Infantry Regiment in the Kola region north of Lake Ladoga. The Soviet 8th Army aimed for a quick breakthrough across the Kolanyoki River, but they were utterly unprepared to fight in such a region. Heavily wooded, with barely any infrastructure at the best of times, the Soviets tried to advance now in one of the worst winters in modern history, with snow up to 2 meters deep and temperatures down to minus 30. Hauhe was given a Finnish Mosin Nagant M2830, which had been in production since 1928 a bit shorter and a bit heavier than the Russian manufactured rifles, but with the typical Mosin Nagant reliability and accuracy, the M28 was an excellent sniper rifle. Nicknamed the Pistikorva, pointy ear, for the large ears on the front sight, it would perform well in the hands of an experienced marksman like Simo Hauhe. The Finns could not hope to win against the might of the Soviet army in a straight up pitched battle. The Soviets simply had more of everything, tanks, men, artillery. Instead, the Finnish art of war relied heavily on hit and run tactics with men on skis who knew the terrain, outflanking, infiltrating and ambushing the sluggish Soviet invaders, many of whom had no skis or did not know how to ski, ruining mobility. While the Finns were naturally familiar with the winter conditions, the Soviet forces were woefully not. Many came from the military district of Leningrad and had not even been supplied for a long drawn out conflict. The winters in Finland are harsh and unforgiving. And even when the sun is out during the short days, it is still bitterly cold. Herhe wrapped himself in a thick and heavy snowsuit, insulating himself as much as possible from the snow and the cold winds. And he wore fur mittens and a sniper mask. The white color of his clothing blended in perfectly with the winter environment and the snow-covered forests of Kola. He preferred to work alone, being accustomed to stalking the deep forests on his own, and he knew to rely on his instincts. Patience was vital, as was leaving as little trace of his passage as possible. A hunter had to be cunning and precise in his actions, carrying only a day's worth of food and around 50 or 60 rounds with him Hayuhei relied on his knowledge of the wilderness to find a good spot from which he could establish his sniper's nest. Once he found his position, he would build a little snow fort around himself 
to blend in with the environment, he placed his rifle on a snowbank that both stabilized his aim and prevented any snow from being thrown up by the recoil, and waited for the enemy to march into his killing field. When Soviet soldiers, struggling and freezing in the snow, would cross his path, Hei Hei put a handful of snow in his mouth to hide his breath. Then he pulled the trigger. It is said that during his training in the army, he was able to hit a target 150 meters away up to 16 times a minute. So now, the marching routes were full of dead Soviet soldiers who fell prey to the hidden marksmen without ever knowing what had hit them. Soviet positions were soon discovered, deserted of the living, but packed with bodies, frozen in their last positions before being shot and killed. Sometimes they were found still standing up, and in the sub-zero temperatures, even a minor wound was often fatal, as the weakened body would have a harder time surviving the elements. And Hei Hei is believed to have not missed his target very often. In his short time at the front, his kill tally would rise to unprecedented levels. Hundreds fell to his rifle. So many, in fact, that his superiors did not believe the stories at first. Apparently, just before Christmas, he killed 25 soldiers in just one day. While many Finnish and Soviet snipers used modern sniping rifles outfitted with telescopic lenses, Hei Hei relied on the old-fashioned iron sights. Not only did he feel that this gave him a better picture of his target, but more importantly, it would allow him to keep his head down lower and in turn, lower his whole profile, making him harder to spot. And lenses could reflect the light and reveal position, as was the case with many Soviet marksmen who were sent out to counter-snipe him and instead met their fate to his outdated rifle. But Hei Hei was also trained with the 9mm Suomi submachine gun, and depending on the fighting at hand, he also carried hand grenades and a traditional Pulko army knife as a last resort. As a sniper acting often alone beyond the front lines, Hei Hei had to be careful and often forfeited obvious targets if they would endanger his position. The Soviets began beefing up their own counter-sniping activity, especially after his kill tally gained him both fame and infamy. If they suspected him of being somewhere, they would order artillery strikes in his general direction in the hope of finally neutralizing him. There's even the story that a Soviet commander asked to be sent a famous Soviet sniper to eliminate Hei Hei. After that sniper had killed several Finnish soldiers and officers, he waited for Simo to react and eventually show himself. He waited, and waited, and as the sun went down, he decided to call it a day and was about to get up. That was when Simo Hei Hei shot him right through the head. Another story was that Soviet soldiers began carrying large iron shields into the field to help guard them from sniper fire. The Finnish snipers like Hei Hei were accurate enough that they simply shot them in the kneecaps. Such stories began to circulate more and more, as Simo Hei Hei became famous to friends and foe alike. The Finnish propaganda portrayed him as a symbol that embodied the struggle of little defiant Finland, while the Soviet propaganda called him Pileja Smert, White Death. The legend of White Death spoke of a ghost-like figure that was both everywhere and nowhere, creeping tirelessly through the woods. It freaked the Soviet soldiers out, and it boosted Finnish morale. On February 17, 1940, 80 days after the invasion, Simo Heihe was officially proclaimed a hero of Finland by the Finnish government, and with hundreds of kills to his name already then, was awarded the Kola Cross. He was promoted and gifted a custom-made Sako M2830 rifle. But despite the legends, Simo Heihe was not invincible and was not a ghost. He was a man, just like any other Finn manning the defenses. In early March 1940, as the winter receded, it became clear that though Finland had, had astonished the world by holding off the mighty Red Army, they could not hold out forever. The Soviets were learning, were gathering more firepower and more competent leaders and tactics. And as the winter ended, so too did the Finnish advantage with the weather. No matter how valiantly they resisted, the numbers would eventually crush them. On March 6th, Hei Hei was caught up in the middle of a renewed Soviet offensive against Kola. 
fighting with the regular troops, Hei Hei had again killed at least a dozen that day. An exploding bullet hit him in the jaw and ripped his lower face apart. Saved by his comrades, he was dragged out of the fighting and into hospital. He spent several days in a coma, and when he awoke on March 13th, peace had been signed. The war was over for both him and his country. For around 25,000 square miles of territory, the Soviets had paid a high price. Most estimates of the Soviet dead are around 130,000, but it may actually have been as high as a quarter of a million dead men. Finland had David and Goliath, the USSR, on a scale no one imagined possible. Finnish independence had been saved. Simo Heihe would bear the wounds to his face for the rest of his life, but otherwise fully recovered. He could not go back to his own home, though, which was now on the other side of the Soviet border. But he found a new home and lived a long, peaceful life until his death in 2002. In later interviews, Hei Hei repeatedly emphasized that during his service in the Winter War, he simply did what he was told. But he was the best at it. In not even a hundred days, his official score was 505 kills, making him the most successful sniper in history. That's just the official tally. Unofficially, it was higher. Now, of course, those numbers will always be debatable, such is the nature of war. But the legend of white death is very much alive today, and not just in Finland. When asked what it was that made him such a great sniper, Hei Hei simply answered, practice. So why, of all the military figures available throughout the history of humanity, did you pick Simo to write about? The story of Simo is one of the most inspiring in military history, at least for me. Personal opinion, of course, but uh, that song and that story is kind of important for Sabaton history because without that song, maybe we wouldn't even have the album Heroes that came later. Okay, but it wasn't. his song isn't on Heroes. No, 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 that's on Coat of Arms. Uh, that was the first time we asked our fans, that's you guys, uh, about sending in... Uh, basically giving us ideas for songs. Okay, but you, you guys still do that. Yes, sorry. absolutely. But this was the beginning. That was the first time. We got a lot, yeah. lots and lots. Pat's mailbox was, you know, totally full. That was one of the stories that really, you know, only by reading kind of the name makes you want to find out. Now, so if they're sending in, you know, several thousand suggestions, you obviously can't read whole biographies about all of these people or anything, right? Oh, no, just... no, 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 no. Obviously, uh, Pat is the one who is uh, going through it all, basically. Is that right, Pat? Yeah! All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, Pat is sitting over there, and I mean, he's probably doing that right now, looking at suggestions. Okay. How many do you have per day, Pat? 50 or something? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pat. Let, let's see. Um... <laughs> The, the latest one is this. Okay. Uh, song topic, Global Conquest. Okay, there are many good tales of heroism. People from Portugal, Spain. Oh, this is interesting. Okay. Portuguese and Spanish explorers. Okay. Sebastian Elcano and El Magellan, right? Traveling around the world for the first time. Pizarro. That would be interesting, although... Hmm. Okay, and who sent this in to you? Uh, Adrian, Adrian Crespo. Hey, Adrian Crespo. From me and from Sabaton. Okay, so Pear actually is looking at your ideas to try and figure out what they're going to write more songs about. Well, so he chose from, or he picked, maybe made a short list. You saw White Death, you thought, I want to learn more about a guy whose nickname is the White Death. And it's a good metal title. It really song. is a good metal title. <laughs> no, seriously though, for us, at that point, I don't think we had that many songs about a single individual. Oh, right, I mean, we yeah, covered sure. a little, the, on the bigger scale all the battles and stuff, but zooming in so much was really inspiring to write the lyrics. Okay. We didn't even know we were going to do Heroes, but me and Par basically said that, man, why, maybe one day we should do a more personal album, you know? Now, when you were, uh, you know, reading up about Simo and stuff, were you also studying the Winter War in general, or were you just really more focusing on just the individual? We'd already covered the Winter War, in a way, in the song Tal on, yeah. on the Art of Which War. Which we before. did an episode. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, check it out. And what was the reaction then, since, uh, since you didn't do really individuals uh, before? I mean, what was the reaction among the Finns, for example, to this? 
for the Finnish people, I mean, most people in Finland would know about Sima Hauha. However, us coming from Sweden, we didn't. I mean, yeah, that's true. Every every nation has its own history. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people in Pakistan who don't know who Fonzi is, but I grew up with Fonzi. <laughs> you know. Important part of military history, right? We're there. gonna do an episode on Fonzi one day. Yes, too. that would be kind of cool if you guys wrote a song. We should have Pat play him the part, you know, as well. Oh, Pat doing the thumbs up and the leather. That'd yeah, be great. yeah, you'd be give, Fonzi. Yeah, oh, we'll give, wow, him, give him a haircut great. and everything. It's fine. All right, well, that was The White Death, and this is Sabaton History for today. See you next time. Thanks, everybody, for watching this week's episode of Sabaton History Channel. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Don't forget to support us here on Patreon. And we will see each other very soon again, okay? What is that? Become Patreon. Better for your health.